Welcome to the Zombie Book Club, the only book club where the book is your real life and the zombies are flakes of snow slowly burying you in negative 30 degree weather. I'm Dan, and when I'm not surviving a dystopian nightmare of living life as an elder millennial, I'm writing a book where the choices of those in power cause the zombie outbreak uh, that the rest of the world has to pay for. Mm. And I'm Leah, and when I'm not busy fearing for my life because of creepy men or the possibility of creepy men, I'm actively unlearning generational trauma of internalized misogyny. Today we're talking about real life survival stories. You guessed it. Yeah, we are survivors <laughs> of Sur life. Yes. <laughs> Life's circumstances. I'm a survivor. Uh, da, da, da. Anyways. Uh, we release episodes every Sunday. So subscribe. Also rate and review. We yeah. like that. It makes us happy. We love it. Yeah, we should check our reviews. It's true. We say we want them. I'll check them after. The Everybody's like, I do it every week. <laughs> I refuse. I still haven't been acknowledged. This is a casual dead up epi episode. Episode. Yeah. Episode, as we say around the house. Yeah. Z -Z we use a lot of Z words instead yeah. of S's and, and words Z? for fun. Yeah. Like zoo. Yeah. So it's uh, every Sunday. So zo sub zub zribe. I'm going to edit this out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Life updates, Dan. How yeah, life updates, there? Leah. <laughs> What's going on with you? And we're not recording podcasts. Uh, so, I mean, by the time this comes out, this will be old news. Or will it? I don't know. I think it'll be like right on time news. It will be. Um, I'm so sorry. Yeah, so the paving season uh, creeps ever slowly towards uh, towards me like a zombie I forgot was in the room. Like a slow zombie. Yeah, like a night of the living dead But it's zombie. gonna get you because there's no escape. In the closet and the whole time that we've been boarding up the windows, we've been trapping ourselves inside with it. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, paving. It's what I do to make money. Um, I drive a truck and they fill it up with asphalt and I you pour know, it on the ground. We went out for breakfast this morning and the server thanked you. I almost felt like they were thanking you for your service. They were like, I appreciate a smooth road. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're right. I am a hero. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, last year we did episodes like biweekly because of my work season. Yeah. Um, we thought it was a little bit uh, too, too much too to, ambitious. Do, to do a weekly uh, episode. But we're going to try to keep up the weekly schedule. If we change that, don't be surprised. But also just don't be surprised if a lot of these episodes turn into winging it. Yeah, like this episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it'll be better if we wing it. Let's find out. Um, yeah, so it's going to be hard to keep up this pace. Um, I'm going to try, uh, but it's it's a lot to not only just record the episodes, um, but planning the episodes and then editing the episodes. Uh, it's a lot of work. And then posting on social media, which we already <laughs> suck at. Yeah. I go through phases where I'm really good about it. And then ironically, I'm better at posting on social media when I'm at work. Huh. <laughs> An escape. An it escape. is kind of like. You know, after I've been screamed at by somebody because I, uh, I, I don't know, spilled too much asphalt or whatever, mm. uh, I'm like, ooh, I wonder what the zombie book club's up to. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to hear um, all about Dan's adventures, I'm sure, this this summer. We call it this summer, but it's actually eight months of Dan's life. Yeah. And I realize we probably do that to, like, in our minds, psychologically shorten just how long this goes on for. But just to give context, this is not a regular jobs job, folks. Like, this is a... Uh, Dan leaves at five in the morning. If I'm lucky, Dan gets home at five. Lucky. Oh, I mean, that's a good day. That's a good day. That's a, like, oh, wow. Like you're home on time. This a lot is of nice. times it's 4 a.m. to 8 p.m. Yeah, not <laughs> not exaggerating. And so what that means is like while we sleep beside each other, we sleep beside each other. We eat dinner together on a good night. And um, by the time it's the weekend, Dan is pretty exhausted because his job is very physically demanding. Yeah. Uh, and then on top of that, they, we have like, you know chores to do like mowing the lawn that stands uh role primarily not because he's a man but because he's a better driver than me and our terrain is incredibly hilly and complicated and he is afraid for my life which i think is fair because i take unnecessary risks yeah i i often have um a shockingly low fear of hurting myself yeah and that's usually when i get hurt and also i think that sometimes like if you don't have like a certain level to the skill set like you don't know when something really terrible is about to happen and like yeah. when when i'm in a vehicle it's like it's like they are an extension of my arms and legs yeah but we want to like not only not only can i tell when i'm about to roll over or something 
but also my feet and hands act without me having to think about it too much as to like how to correct that problem. Yeah. Whereas that is not me. I'm just, I feel like I used to mow the lawn as a kid. This is a riding lawn mower, folks. We've got a lot of land. We're very lucky. <laughs> yeah. The goal is to terraform it um, with permaculture principles to make it like basically a big food forest where we don't have very much to mow, but that's going to take years to do. Yeah. So in the meantime, because we have neighbors who we don't want to have totally hate us, we have to mow at least some of it. Um, we already mow also, less than ticks. people used to. Oh, yeah. Also ticks. Yeah. Keeps away the ticks to keep the grass short. Um, but we're going to keep doing this because it's fun. Yeah. This is this is our escape from the mundanity of uh, normal life. Yeah. And it's fun because like I get to look down in the eyes while he tells me funny things. Yeah. Across the table. Um, in other news, I haven't been able to write this week. I don't know yeah. if I wrote last week. I don't know. I don't remember. Um, so I'm not really looking forward to the work season where not only is it difficult to keep up with this podcast, but I absolutely have no time to do any writing. Dan, have we ever talked about how much capitalism sucks? On this podcast? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every episode. I feel like yeah. it makes a little entrance. You know, this this opens up the uh, the door to talk about something actually that uh that I'm really hoping for in my future. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I, I've talked about a lot of things, trying to pivot my career for for one. Mm -hmm. I think we discussed this in a previous episode, how that's not going to happen. And I just kind of have to, like, go back to paving. Yeah. Um, part of that is because, like, you know, I, I have I have PTSD from being uh, at war and, um, you know, of various other injuries as well that uh, basically make it really, I don't even want to say difficult, but actually impossible for me to just, like, be one of those people that shows up to work every day and is able to like answer a phone and talk to people yeah. and like engage with clients and customers and bosses without pounding their faces in. Which for the good of yourself and society, it's for the best that you're like not a McDonald's worker. Yeah. I feel like a like you being like a frontline service worker would be I worked at Advanced Auto Parts and that was more than I could handle. Yeah, the worst parts of you would come out, I think. And it I think did. that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so like I was trying to pivot my career so that like maybe I could do like work from home, helping people with social media and stuff like that, because those are things that I'm actually good at. Um, it's actually kind of interesting to watch like the path of my career go from like this place of um, working in this serious like tech environment where like you know, I have to use 100% of my brain all the time for work and then just slowly downgrading and downgrading and downgrading until I'm like, uh, I, I just pave roads now. <laughs> yeah, it's an important thing that you do, to be yeah. clear, like the diner person said to you. But I think that it's an evidence of um, when you have the kind of trauma and physical disabilities that you have from being a young person who went to war, just joined the military period. Yeah. Uh that it has long-term consequences and for one like capitalism already sucks yeah. okay being torn away from your family for like the majority of your work week when it's a normal work week sucks yeah but i think that it's like someone like you has so much to contribute to the world that doesn't fit in the boxes that we think of as work yeah. and i feel like your world has gotten narrower and narrower as time has passed when it comes to work opportunities because of the specific needs that you have and that has nothing to do with how much value you have as a human being or the ways that you contribute because i mean you give me so much not to get really emotional here on the podcast but i guess i am it's too late it's what we're doing now yeah um <laughs> but capitalism doesn't uh the the um the the people who want to make money off of you are going to struggle and the and the things that you would have to do are going to be mad at you pretty much and the things that you would have to do in most jobs are things that are not good for you they're harmful for you. And on top of that, I have a lot of uh, <clears throat> physical injuries as well. Yeah. That like over the last 20 years, which is how long it's been since I've gotten out of the army, as ju I've just like, they went from a place where I could ignore it. And that's what I did for 20 years. And now it's at a point where I can't ignore it. And I'm, I'm at, I'm almost at the point where I'm like, I'm like, I can't drive a dump truck anymore because yeah. it's unbearable. It's really, really painful. Yeah. It's not, it's not good folks. And, um, you know, join the revolution, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like, I can't imagine the stories of the people that are listening to this. Um, you know what? If you're somebody who loves your day job and loves capitalism, just don't, don't. Yeah, just shut up. Yeah. <laughs> who 
are you and how brainwashed have you become? Getting back to what I was originally going to say before I had to give all that backstory. <laughs> um, I'm working with lawyers to like try to increase my uh, my VA disability rating. And for people who don't know, your disability rating determines how much you are compensated for your injuries by the government through yeah. Veterans Affairs. And uh, right now I have one, but it's not as high as it's, it's supposed to be. And it's supposed to be 100%. Yeah. <laughs> and if I was able to raise it to that, or at least really close, um, I can kind of just not give a fuck about going back to work anymore, which is my goal. That's my goal. I don't want to work. Yeah, you can do things that are meaningful to you. Like writing um, a book. Yeah. <laughs> and to our household, like... Yeah. Uh, the way that you support me during the off work season is fucking so invaluable. Yeah, I I like it. I like cooking. I like taking care of things. I like doing the shopping. I like doing all the things that is difficult for you to do right now because of your injuries. Yeah. And also that you don't have time to do because you're busy making money. And yeah, <laughs> that's my job is to make the dollars, which I'm perfectly fine with. But it is true. Like, I think that we are an example of um, why capitalism sucks, because uh, we are like one injury away, a.k.a. your injury from being fucked, like fucked, because if you weren't able to do the things that I have needed you to do, I don't honestly, we probably would just be eating like a microwave cat potato, food. Oh. <laughs> cat food. Sure. Um, like literally, I have maintained being fed because of this human being across from me on the table it's the last uh, I don't even know how long now, eight months yeah, or so since I was told to like stop walking completely, basically. Um, so yeah. And that doesn't make sense because I'd like to believe that we both provide value. I mean, Hey, you're listening to us talk right now. Yeah. I didn't know we were going to go down this route, but I just kind of like went this direction. <laughs> with, I hope it's okay. With our life update. Yeah. I think it's fine. I just, um, you know. I'm frustrated because it doesn't, it doesn't have to be like this. Yeah. You are a valuable contributor to your community yeah. in the ways that you are able and want to contribute. And that's all that matters. So be nice. Universal, if that was universal basic income. Now that's yeah. basically my argument. They're actually talking about that for veterans. They should do it for everybody, but if they yeah. got to start with somebody fine. Yeah. I feel like uh, for anybody who thinks that the uh, universal health care or, or uh, basic income um, doesn't work like the v the VA is is like doing these things. Yeah. Like you can see that it's already working. It would be life changing for you. Yeah, it would. Well, on a much less serious note, we are actually like days away from having our T-shirts up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. I It would have been already up as of the recording of this podcast. Probably by the time you hear this, it'll be old news. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, there was a, the, a, a big, long process um, that involved, you know, wanting to incorporate a shirt store into our website that we haven't launched yet well it is launched but we haven't told anybody about it yet <laughs> uh and uh and we wanted that to be integrated and the process for doing that involved setting up a business license and having a tax id and i'm like oh my god i don't remember it being so hard to do this so uh now we're just gonna go through a different place that actually just lets us set up a, a merchandise store and it's simple quick and easy and simple we can just do it right away. And the merch is cute. Yeah, we just have to wait for them to okay it. I think the biggest problem is like us buying all of our own merch because I want it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm at, uh, Depending on the shirt quality, I might just like order like high viz <laughs> t-shirts. <laughs> There'll be just one that's like all of our zombie chicken merchandise. And then just one that's just like high viz green and has, doesn't have any design on it. And I'm like, that's for Dan. That's just work. me. So I could buy it. <laughs> Because it's just, it's hard to find things in my size. You know, as you get a, to be a bigger person, it's like, it's like they forget that people also get taller and bigger at the same time. It's not just either you're uh, Danny DeVito or you're Shaquille O'Neal, like there's in mm. the middle where you're a refrigerator and all of my shirts fit like halter tops. I mean, that's a bit of an exaggeration. <laughs> Sometimes a little bit of your tummy comes out. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes a lot of it comes out. Well, I think, you know, speaking of capitalism, I'm just going to fucking shit on capitalism this entire episode. If we lived in a world where things were handmade, you would be measured and you'd have things made for you. But because we live in these standardized systems, uh, it's really hard to find things that fit right, which is why yeah. I love the clothes I'm wearing because they're free size, free size clothing. Yeah. 
Team free size. It's wonderful. Uh, on my side, I've got a few things. I'm going to just uh, list them first for updates. Experimental procedures hurt. Ah. Tattoos hurt. Working hurts. Uh, also, my dogs are indisputably the cutest dogs in the world of all time. Hmm. And we had a snowpocalypse where we had 36 inches in less than 24 hours after a 50 degree weather for two fucking weeks. Yeah. So all the frozen ground turned into mud and then the dump three feet of snow on top of it. Yeah. That's basically my updates. I did an experimental procedure on my foot. It fucking hurt. Uh, I had to take a whole week of work off that I didn't yeah. expect to take off. I, was, I thought like maybe I might need a day. Honestly, like I thought I'd need the day of the surgery or not surgery. It's not surgery, but the day of the procedure, like maybe the next day. No, whole week. <laughs> yeah. Just ruined um tattoos this is the biggest tattoo i've ever gotten i love it but like wow the last week and a half of watching that thing heal and like feeling it and resisting the urge to scratch it the fact that this is like one of two sessions for this tattoo really makes me brace myself for the second one and yet i still want more yeah and also i resolved a dental emergency that's been that's going on for like three true. weeks yeah you like there's been a lot of pain in this household <laughs> yeah. and pain recovery yeah we've we've definitely gone through a few bottles of painkillers at this point yeah <laughs> between and, the two of us yeah and like really just tired i mean mostly you sorry but yeah, yeah mostly me just just tired um in general and uh so we've been like putting off recording and i'm glad we're finally doing it because i would say today's probably the first day we genuinely have energy since yeah. the last time we recorded which was i think two weeks ago to do it definitely the first time this weekend that i wasn't an absolute zombie yeah yeah and then the snow apocalypse did not help because it was oh like God. a dumping of snow out of nowhere we couldn't even snow blow it because it was so it was so heavy yeah like my the tires of the of our of our lawn tractor would just spin in the mud underneath because everything's snow. soft underneath yeah. i feel like the permafrost has already left yeah we've already had mud season like five times this winter i spent like two and a half hours trying to snow blow our driveway and I successfully made it to the end of our driveway and back up again. Yeah, that and was it. then fucked up the driveway. Like, fucked up the driveway. That's part of it. I I had I got to the I got all the way down to the bottom of our driveway. We're on a hill, um, and the tire debeated from the rim, mm. <laughs> so I had to take the whole wheel off, bring it up to the garage, rebeat it, fill it with air, bring it back down, and then I started going back up the hill. We got almost to the top. And the other tire debeated and separated from the rim. <laughs> like a fucking nightmare. Meanwhile, I'm like in the house petting the dogs. Doo, doo, doo. I did shovel to get the dogs uh, to the we have like these stairs that melt the snow, which has been so helpful. But I had to shovel a part of our deck to get them there. And that that took me like, I don't know, to shovel. What do you how many feet do you think that is? Eight feet to shovel an eight foot. Probably by like one foot wide pathway it took me 45 minutes. Yeah. Just to get them to the stairs. It was deep and it was heavy. Yeah, it was really intense. And um, again, another reminder of why it's important to be prepared for anything. Yeah. We didn't lose power this time. That was a win. Mm -hmm. um, but it and was... we were ready for it, too. Yeah. And <laughs> also like Nero, who we love dearly, is not in here with us right now. Um, but maybe he'll come because he can hear us talking about him. We'll see. <laughs> he was like so fucking mad at the snow. Oh, my God. He was he so was mad. so mad. He was out there. He was like making his own paths. And like when I tell you that the snow was as tall as him, I am not exaggerating. Yeah. He was literally just like too. plowing with his face and his body to like make a path so he could go bark at the wind, I guess. Yeah, he'd, he'd like bark up at the sky. He's yeah. just like, stop it. Stop Ziggy, it. who is less than 12 inches tall, was just like, fuck this. Yeah, he, so he didn't even try. He's just like, I'm going to pee on the. I don't deck. even blame him because like we could we shoveled a little bit, but it just kept coming. So now it's melting. It's almost all gone. And apparently it's going to snow again this week. And I, you know, I miss the South. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still this don't. This time of year is pollen season in the South, but it's oh also really beautiful. All the flowers are out. It's really oh. nice. The azaleas are gorgeous. Yeah. If those of you who are listening in the South, uh, fuck you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy your beautiful flowers and uh, take lots of antihistamines yeah <laughs> they already know yeah but the the uh the the topic du jour of the day dan is something i wanted you to talk about in the podcast for a long time since our friend molly came to visit and you told this story i'd heard it once before but possibly the influence of mushrooms made it even more epic we'll we'll see how epic it is today <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm not on mushrooms you're not on mushrooms the audience may or may not be on mushrooms i think it was molly's reaction because like molly's from florida yeah <laughs> and um 
I the think, only things are normal to me, but Molly's just like, what the fuck? I don't think we should have ever told Molly if we wanted a chance in hell of her moving up north. Because she was just <laughs> like, I don't know how y'all like y'all might be afraid of hurricanes and like poisonous snakes, but this is way worse. Yeah. To be fair, where I lived when this story took place is a special part of the world that like it, it defies all logic. Yeah. Um should we just jump in jump into it? I think we should. I mean, you wrote this very interesting thing in the beginning. Ah, yes. So speaking of times where I was a complete zombie this weekend when we were writing this outline, uh, I could not focus. It's true. I was just sitting there. I was I was depressed. I was agitated and I had brain fog. And I was just like, I cannot. I can't even form words. If you spoke to me using words, I'd have to sit there and think about it for about 30 seconds before I was like, oh, yeah, I guess I guess we could have bagels. <laughs> <laughs> it's he's not exaggerating so what i wrote was my whole life is a survival story and there are so many stories that i feel very uncomfortable sharing with people and feel a great amount of vulnerability hangover when i do it's the reason i'm writing a book because it's easier to talk about things when it's fiction i can just laugh and say well that was a fun story huh <laughs> oh you know the the book that i'm writing it is a way for me to vent about like a lot of the crazy things that I have experienced in my life through, you know, through a narrative of fiction. But mm -hmm. like the feelings and the experiences are there, like the the uh, the the constant like assault of just being in the middle of a place where everything around you wants you to die. Yeah. And just a constant belt fed machine gun nightmare is what I would describe my book as. Mm. <laughs> Not yet, because I haven't gotten to that part yet, <laughs> but I'm getting there slowly, getting but there. surely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And while I don't really want to talk a whole lot about things that happened when I was in the art, uh, I, I do want to express those ideas and those feelings and kind of sort out it, with myself what it's all about. Mm. And that's what my writing is about. So that said, um, I am going to tell a survivor story, but it's it has nothing to do with when I was in the army. Now, honestly, though, <laughs> it's fucking epic. So uh, buckle your seatbelts, as yeah. they say. You know, this is, it's Actually, funny you know jumping what? into this story after talking about how broken and old I am. Yeah, really? Because <laughs> this was this probably didn't help you, but I think you already had challenges at that point. But OK, so just just set the scene for yourself. I highly recommend before listening to this story that you get a cozy blanket. Oh, yeah. A nice hot cup of hot chocolate or tea or Unless coffee. it's hot outside. Unless it's hot outside, then just um, put your feet on a block of ice to really yeah. like empathize with what you're about to hear. Get the oscillating fan hitting every inch of, of your body. Yeah. Yeah, just have it oscillate from your head to toe and back again. Yeah, and be naked. <laughs> I mean, that feels like it should be like an R&B song, sitting in front of an oscillating fan. How would it from go? From the head to the toe and back again. Oh. I mean, it's kind of hot. Sounds spicy. But it's about a fan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it's how I feel in the summer. <laughs> Let's dig into this. We also have a survival story from a friend and listener that we're looking forward to that we'll listen we'll listen to after this. And I don't think we'll have time for any of mine. So that might oh, be a future yeah. episode because I, I think this story deserves time yeah well, uh, let's so see how fast i rattle through it <laughs> let's set the stage okay so you're living in upstate new york and by upstate new york we don't mean 45 minutes north of fucking new york city no i mean a place you would never go a yeah. place that when people do find themselves there they never find a way out of again they live they they're born there they die there or they get trapped there later in life it's called watertown new york <laughs> I actually lived in a small town called Copenhagen, which is not even part of Watertown. And that is, if you were from the area, um, worse. Yeah. <laughs> now, being 45 minutes away from the shithole that everyone wants to escape from is worse than the actual shithole. <laughs> Question. Would you go back there in an apocalypse scenario? Do you think it would be yeah. a good survival location because of its remoteness? It, it would be a good survival location because of my familiarity of the area. Mm. Um, and I think we talked about that once. Yeah, I think we did. It's also closer to my family, but um, that's neither here nor there. It's it's a close proximity to Fort Drum. If mm -hmm. anybody knows, you know, uh, Fort Drum is home of the 10th Mountain Division. It's also where Special Forces operators go to do cold weather training. Wow. Yeah. Um, that is that's, great 
foreshadowing for this story. <laughs> you know, I'd meet people in the army and, you know, they'd be like, I, I was in, I went to Fort Drum to do cold weather training. I'm like, cool. I grew up there. <laughs> I just lived life. There. You lived in a cabin in the woods, like an off grid cabin yeah. in the woods there. So let's get into the story. So let's yeah. just set the stage. It's in upstate New York, aka a uh, rural area near Watertown. It's the mid dead winter, right? Middle of the winter. This is January 7th. And you live in town and your mom lives five miles away from you. Yeah. So um, to start off, my mom is on a cruise, not in upstate New York. Right. There are no cruises there. No one would want that. <laughs> uh, she's actually on a cruise um, for my aunt's wedding. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Lovely time. They're having a great time. <laughs> and why are, what, what are you doing? For your mom. I am uh, watching after her house and her dogs. Um, she had she had two dogs and a whole bunch of cats mm -hmm. and a giant farmhouse. I don't even know how many rooms. I'm going to say 10. It's huge and it's haunted. <laughs> it is haunted. Um, thing about, uh, you know, farmhouses up north is that they're all wood heated and you have to feed uh, the furnace or else it becomes sub- zero temperatures inside the farmhouse because they are drafty yeah and to get to the furnace you have to go outside uh no this no? this one um we it was just in the basement so we oh, go down okay. the basement stairs to where there is a uh, nightmarish dungeon of a of a basement with a dirt floor and a little um concrete area that looks like a room that has no windows or doors but is crumbled away so you can see inside and wonder how many human bones are in there yeah, it's a just it's a scary place all by itself. <laughs> so um, so it was very necessary for me to be there to put wood into the stove every, you know, four to six hours. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you live when you live in upstate New York and you have a wood stove, you wake up in the middle of the night to you put it. your boots on and you go throw wood in the fire. And it's either really fucking hot in your house or cold. Yeah. Well, back then it was only ever cold mm. because my mom hadn't done the renovations to make it hold the yet. warmth um, in. I didn't know that. <laughs> and you had to let the dogs out all the time. Yeah. So on this day, uh, where this horrifying story occurs of survival, uh, you're not at your mom's house to start. No, I am. You are. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'll just, I'll, just give, the I'll give the details because there's, there's some details that are important here. Okay. Uh, one, I am staying at my mom's house for the week. It's because I'm feeding the dogs. My apartment's not that far away, and I do go there during the day to use the internet. Mm. Also, I'm working. I work uh, as a field service technician for Dell. I go to people's houses, and I repair their computers. Yeah, important note for those of you who have never lived rural. He has to leave his mom's house to get the internet because there is no internet at his mom's house. Right. This is the 2010s, and there's still no internet at his mom's house. <laughs> yeah, I think my, my mom only has internet now because she has a hotspot. Yeah, a wife, a, a, a like a like a four G hotspot, and that's yeah. it. So, um, so it's a weekday. I need to go to work. Uh, my work day entails usually driving about four hundred miles all around New York State, fixing people's computers. Yeah. What snow I, or shine? Yeah, and what I didn't realize is um, something that I didn't realize until I started driving on the road, which is that there was a huge storm. I'm I'm used to storms at this point. You know, uh, rain or shine, I got to go. Yeah. And uh, snow is just common in that, like yeah. a lot of fucking snow. If I if it's I normal. if I didn't work every time there was a, a, a fucking blizzard, they would have fired me because nobody would I wouldn't work all winter. <laughs> so um, so I take off and I'm driving and I don't see any other cars on the road. And like the snow is pretty deep at this point, I'd say like at least a foot deep so, on the road. Like, I'm I'm pushing I'm pushing snow out of the road with my front bumper in my 2004 Dodge Stratus. Um and that's when I hear on the radio that the governor has declared a state of emergency and that all roads in New all of New York state have been closed to the public. And anyone driving on those roads will be pulled over by state troopers. And what do you do when you hear this? Well, I mean, I'm already committed, so like I just got to keep driving because mm. like if I slow down, I might not be able to get moving again. Okay. So I just keep driving. I'm on I'm on the road that my mom lives on, which is about four miles long. Um, I will reach a, a three point a three way intersection, 
and turn into the town that I live at, at my apartment. So I'm like, I'm just going to go to my apartment and see what's going on. Well, I get to the end of this road and there's a giant snowbank instead of, you know, what you would expect to see where the road is. And I just crash into the snowbank. And because it's a three way intersection, I have to stop or else I might get hit by a car. Damn. And I get stuck. So I'm out there. There's there's a there's a Jeep that almost plows into me and slides around and goes into the into the guardrail on the other side and just keeps going. And it's it's a crazy situation. And I have to call a tow truck to pull me out of the snowbank. And a tow truck comes, they pull me out of the snowbank. And uh and at this point, like just getting out of the car, I can feel like my hands start to like like uh get frostbite. It's cold. Um my ears got frostbite. My my beard froze just from stepping outside of the car and like trying to dig a little bit. Uh, it's not good. So they pull me out of the snowbank. It costs one hundred and eight dollars. <laughs> I remember you will never forget that amount. <laughs> yeah. And also they pulled me out and then they're like, all right, well, good luck. And I'm like, I'm not all the way out. You didn't pull me into the road. I can't move yet. And oh he's like, God. fine. And he pulls me <laughs> another two feet out of the out of out onto the road. And then I drive to my apartment and I, I sit there for most of the day wondering what the hell I'm going to do, because the snow just got worse. It just yeah. kept getting worse. And it's illegal to drive. Literally, they have told you to not drive. Yeah. Legally. And uh, I'm like, well, maybe maybe it'll clear up in a little bit. You know, maybe if I wait here a few hours, you know, I can I can message my boss, tell him I'm not working that day uh, on account of the, the you know, the state of emergency. Um, my boss asked me if I would be able to get out on the road later that day. And I told him, no. Where did your boss live? Oklahoma. <laughs> Yeah, they had no contact. And well, he's, he's like, well, can you go out anyways? Like, if you just drive slow, can you do it? And I'm like, dude, the governor made it illegal to drive today. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not working. Yeah. <laughs> anyways, um, there's a point later in the afternoon where I am really upset now because there is no way for me to get back to my mom's house. The dogs are in crates. They have to be put in crates during the day or else they tear things apart. And they are in there and they don't have they don't have like food or water other than like maybe like a small bowl, I think. And mm -hmm. that was it. And I'm like, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to get back there this week. I don't know when I'm going to be able to come back to my mom's house. Mm. And I, it almost it, it brought me to tears to be perfectly honest like i broke down because i'm like these animals are going to have to suffer because i wasn't smart enough to look outside and be like i can't drive in that i d i decided to drive anyway because capitalism baby you gotta make that money <laughs> like i didn't feel like i had an option of not going into work that day on account of just just on account of snow because you know the company that i worked for my boss was in oklahoma he didn't give a shit if it was snowing he didn't know what that meant yeah not not in the uh the the frozen tundra of northern new york <laughs> like he just he just thinks oh well you know just drive slow and it's like no that is not an option yeah so i actually hold on i i forgot that i screenshotted this i That's made a right. post on facebook uh, it's not the best post because i'm i wasn't the writer that i am today <laughs> <laughs> what year is this again this was 2014 right um January 7th, 2014, I say, so this morning I left my house, my mom's house, which I am house sitting. <laughs> um, I'm watching the dogs and cats and feeding the wood stove until she gets home on Friday. In a short amount of time, the weather took a, t a turn for the worst and I found myself separated from the house. And more importantly, the animals who need to be fed and taken care of. The roads are impassable. And upon trying to Upon trying to blind drive through the whiteouts and two feet of snow in the roads, I crashed into a snowbank and had to be dragged out by a tow truck. It is not possible for me to make it home in my vehicle. The real intent of this message is to inform that I will be making a second attempt, not by vehicle, as I've already explained is impossible, but by foot. I plan to pack all the necessary provisions I can and make the five-mile journey on foot in sub-zero temperatures. I don't know what, is going to, what it's going to be like out there. <clears throat> digging my car out, my hair and beard froze in a matter of seconds. But I know that I have to try. I should have known not to leave the house in the morning, 
And now animals might have to suffer for several days without food or water if I wait for conditions to improve. Mm. Is this dangerous? Yes. Is this stupid? Most certainly. <laughs> but I only know one thing. I have to try. Wish me luck. Fucking epic. So I, Epic post, Dan. I wrote that post because there was a strong possibility that people might wonder what happened to me. Mm. I did. I did not expect a 100% chance of survival. In fact, I would have said that my chances were 50 50. And why were you willing to take that risk knowing that like, if you died, maybe I don't know if you thought about this. Do you think about the fact that if you died, your mom might also be devastated? Yeah, you die and the animals suffer. Yeah, but also, you know, I'm a veteran. And uh, for a very long time, I have not valued my own life mm. over the lives of other people. Um, and it was something that I wouldn't be able to live with if if those animals uh, were stuck in their cages, died of dehydration, mm. froze to death, because freezing to death is very also much very an option. Real. Yeah, um, because something that I haven't a detail that I haven't said yet is that it was currently negative 30 degrees. The wind speed was 60 miles an hour. Visibility was like less than 10 feet. Um, and the wind chill was between negative 40 and negative 60. Yeah, this is wild. And I don't know that I would have made the same choice, but I understand why you did. Also, like for the audience that doesn't know Dan as well as I do, Dan loves les animaux, animaux, les animaux, yeah. animals, and has a special connection with them. And frankly, I think is uh, slightly psychic because he's able to anticipate the needs of our animal companions yeah. in ways that are wild to me sometimes. <laughs> Uh, it's like they're talking to him. So <sighs> so I understand like your love of animals and why you did it. And also that post is just epic. So so you you write the post, you leave your house, but you before you leave your house, you put on like how many layers of clothes? So I put on three pairs of pants. I didn't have proper cold weather gear. Um, the closest thing that I had to cold weather gear was my Columbia jacket, which I got in Afghanistan. That's the only thing that was rated for sub-zero temperatures that I put on. Mm. Um, I, I was wearing like a pair of sweatpants and two pairs of jeans. Both pairs of jeans had holes in them, in the knees, <laughs> but holes in different places, which ah, is important. Yes, very important. <laughs> um, I packed a backpack. I, I brought water bottles with me and I put them inside of my coat near my chest so that they wouldn't freeze. Mm. This story should be one of those TV shows like I Barely Survived, Naked whatever they're afraid. called. No. Well, I mean, that happens late. Spoiler alert. Naked and Afraid happens later in this story. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> uh, but no, those stories where it's like I shouldn't have survived. Yeah. I've watched some pretty intense ones. And that's what this this story reminds me of. So you're totally dressed. You pack your bag. You yeah. pack your backpack. I put on, put on gloves. Um, I don't know what I had for a hat, but I also my coat had a hood. And that was very important. Mm. Um, I think I had a scarf too, uh, but I'm not sure. Uh, I brought sunglasses because I needed to block my eyes because my eyes would have froze. Also, snow blindness is real. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I packed a backpack with all kinds of things and also grabbed a pair of really cheap uh, Walmart snowshoes that I barely ever, ever used. You know, I have a question for you. Yeah. Did you have a soundtrack and some headphones at least? No. Just you and your thoughts? Yeah. And the howling wind. Mm. Um, so then I took off uh, out of my front door, walked through the town that I lived in. Uh, before I even left town, there was a guy on the side of the road uh, stuck. He was just driving in the road and the road was no longer passable and he could not move his car anymore. So I helped him push his car out of the out of uh, out of the snowbank. And, uh, and he asked if there was a hotel anywhere around. And I said, no. <laughs> oh, fuck. Um, I wonder what happened to him. And uh, Watertown was his best guess, his best bet. And that was a 45 minute drive on a good day. On a good day. <laughs> and considering that um, the nearest interstate was backed up for, for tens and tens of miles, and people were going out there on uh, snowmobiles to rescue people from their cars and taking them to hotels, I didn't think he had a very good chance of getting a hotel room. Damn. Um, so I started my journey and the journey started in my town, which had a main road going through it. One that was being plowed regularly. Mm -hmm. And that's important because I couldn't, there was no sidewalk to walk on. There was no side of the road. 
it was a, a four to five foot tall snowbank on each side. And I only knew if there was a snowplow coming once it got within 10 feet of me. I'd like to pause this story to make a note for listeners, again, who are not uh, from wintry locations or from a wintry location, but not as wintry as this location. You may be tempted to not believe these details. <laughs> Let me tell you, they are real. Yeah, they are very fucking real. You know, I, I should say winter uh, is dangerous right now that um, that that snowstorm brought us 21 feet of snow. That's just I can't. That's yeah. that's that's I've my brain just stopped our our town. And you can look this up on the Internet. The, our town of Copenhagen, New York, was voted the snowiest town in North America. That's snowier than anywhere in the Rocky Mountains. Yeah, that's snowier than Canada. <laughs> I love how that. <laughs> Sorry, as a Canadian, I find that really funny. But yes, well, part of Canada is in the Arctic Circle. It's true, <laughs> and it's the reason true. for that is our proximity to Lake Ontario, and we get what's called lake effect snow. Yeah. So all of this warm-ish winter air comes across Lake Ontario, picks up a whole bunch of humidity from the lake that dumps it on you, and then it hits the Tug Hill Plateau. And all of that snow dumps into the Adirondack Mountains. And it it like snowflakes as big as your fist coming coming. Down. I need to see that. <laughs> no, we need to be no, there you more. No, I mean, <laughs> I need to see that from inside of a cabin. Yeah. By a fire. A roaring fire. Yes. yes. Um, so uh I had to dodge two snow plows. Um, and I only knew they were coming if I listened really hard. Because you're walking in the middle of the road. And saw like really bright flashing lights, which meant I had exactly zero seconds to jump out of the road and which like I had to climb up a five foot snowbank to, mm. to escape it. Otherwise, I was dead. That's scary. And uh, but luckily, that was the shortest part of my trip was walking on a main road. Um, because... You say luckily, but I know what's coming next. <laughs> <laughs> so you get off the main road. Yeah, I get off the main road and I turn on How long on have to... you been walking at that point? I mean, this is a mile um, okay. and it's the easiest mile by far. So I've been walking maybe 20 minutes. Um, and I, and I take the turn where I got stuck previously in my car, um, onto the road that my mom lives on. Uh, I probably have another four miles left at this point. Um, the only saving grace to this is that that 60 mile an hour wind, when I turn onto my mom's road is now at my back. So if I have my hood up, I'm actually pretty well protected against the wind. The road that my mom lives on at this stage was not plowed, and it won't be plowed for another seven days. Wow. And over three feet of snow have already accumulated in the road. So I'm up to my waist in snow, and even with even after putting snowshoes on, I'm still sinking down to my knees in snow. Wow. Um, and I just started walking. And the thing about the amount of snowfall and the visibility is that I couldn't actually tell if I was on a road anymore. I was just walking and I could have been in the middle of a farmer's field. I could have been walking over a lake. Yeah, we should describe the uh, geography of the area. It's pretty flat and it's a... It's well, there's a, some really big hills. There are some big hills, but this particular area is basically like you can see for a really long way because it's relatively usually, flat. Yeah. Usually. And in the other direction of the road are farmer's fields or farms. And then ahead of you nowadays is um, some windmills. I'm not sure if they were even there yet. They weren't there yet. But yeah. like normally you can see a very long way yeah. from this point in all directions. Yeah. And I now face a situation where as I walked past a telephone pole, I couldn't see the next telephone pole. And you were so fucking lucky you didn't die. And Do not ever do this. Don't ever attempt this. And people. as I walked away from the telephone pole that I passed, there was a point in the middle where I couldn't see either telephone pole. And I literally couldn't tell if I was on the road. So what I would have to do is I just have to look at the telephone pole and see the way that the, the, the power lines were, were facing mm -hmm. and then walk in that direction and hope that I found a telephone pole. Wow. Um, the, the, the power lines were also very hard to see because they were, they were frozen. But that's what was your main guide point ice. was the power lines? Yeah. Interesting. I didn't think I know that detail. Are the um, snowshoes that I use now the same snowshoes? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. I it just I occurred to me yeah. now. I forgot. Dan, Dan, I donated <laughs> those to me and got some new ones. And uh, for Christmas or something like that, you got new ones. Yeah. Wow, they have seen they've seen some shit. No wonder they're a little rickety. <laughs> yeah. 
So um, I learned something that I didn't realize was a a survival mechanism that I had been preparing myself for for a very long time, and that was my beard. Mm. I didn't realize how practical it was to have a beard in this situation because um, my beard froze. Like in like, like by by this point, froze. it is a a sheet of ice on my face. Like I wow. like I can feel the ice expanding and pulling the hairs on my skin. But what I didn't realize is that having your beard or hair freeze is actually really helpful hmm. um, because it kept the wind off of my face. I wonder if this is like this for animals too. Yeah, maybe. Um, so like I like I thought that having ice on my face would make my face colder. But what happened is that I had a gap between the ice that formed on the outside of my beard and the the outer layer of my skin because of my body temperature. So How I actually was your body temperature. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you still have all your limbs. Yeah. All of um, your digits. At this point, I figured as long as I kept moving, I would remain alive. Um, if I stopped, I wouldn't. And what was the state of your clothing if your beard was frozen? Oh, it was frozen. Yeah. What's it like to walk? In? I mean, I've been, I've done this, but I want to know for people. Everything who don't that know. wasn't a joint that was moving was frozen. So, like, it was it was like wearing uh, like like um, shin pads for soccer. <laughs> my le- my the the jeans on my legs were frozen so hard, mm. like. I could have like kicked a tree and they would have shattered. <laughs> oh God. Uh, if I, if I took them off, they would stand up on their own. And at what point did it become nighttime? Cause we also, well, also I'm, I'm getting there. Just want to say briefly though, as another reminder for those who don't live in Northern climes, it gets fucking dark early. Like in December, it's dark by four and January it's dark by like four 15. <laughs> it's like yeah. getting slightly better. And that's if the sky is clear. Yeah. So I would say that this, where I'm at in the story now is about an hour in. Okay. And like I said, it's 30 degrees, uh, 30 degrees below zero Fahrenheit uh, to be, to, to specify. Uh, my beard is frozen. My hair is frozen. My clothes are frozen. And yeah, we should, we should have specified that I started my journey at about two o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. One of the comments on my post was, I hope you can get there in two and a half hours. Yeah. <laughs> um. And, uh, yeah, I figured that if nothing else, I have to keep my legs moving. Uh, there is no option for a stopping. Yeah. And you stop, you die. If I, if I get tired, I can't stop. If I twist my ankle, I can't stop. I have to keep going because the second that I stop moving, my body temperature is going to lower. Uh, my legs are going to start to seize up because as long as I'm keeping blood pumping through them, they're going to keep going. Mm. But if I stop, it's going to make my body is going to want to shut down. Right. Um, and I'm at, I'm, I'm, this is a race against time at this point because the sun is setting. And if it's already negative 30 degrees, you can imagine what that's going to be like when the sun goes down. And then the sun went down and I still had a long way left to go. And what I know now is that the temperature dropped to negative 60. You're lucky you have your fingers and toes. Yeah, I will say you are the kind of person that can be warm in really cold environments. So if anybody was going to do this journey, you. Yeah. Your Nordic, uh, your Nordic genes definitely came out to save you. <laughs> yeah. So night falls, Dan, and it's negative 60. It's negative 60. And now on top of the visibility problems from the from the snow, it's also dark. So even even when I walk past a, a telephone pole, I don't see it until i'm right on top of it like i have to be right next to it <sighs> do you stop to like eat or drink or no. anything no okay um in fact i i had my water bottles in my coat mm-hmm. but i kept them there because i felt like it, it uh it as long as i kept them liquid i had like a certain amount of like thermal mass inside mm. of me and what were you thinking at this point i i was thinking that i can't allow myself to die because if I died, I won't be able to let the dogs out of their cages. And uh, no, no thought about your own life. Not really. So I'd say most of the trip, I'm, I'm shivering pretty heavily. Um, so I've, I've, I am hypothermic at this point. I am, let's see. Yeah, violent shaking is stage two, I believe. Mm. So I've just entered stage two hypothermia. And 
the good thing that happens is I suddenly come to a point that is a steep, long downhill section. Mm. And I recognize this because that means I'm one mile away from my mom's house. Yay. And another thing that, that happens that's really good because this because the wind was coming from my back is that the further I go down this hill, the less wind I feel. Mm, that would help. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm still violently shaking and I'm just trying my best just to just to keep moving. Mm. Cause like my my clothes, if they were frozen before, they were like I couldn't even bend my knees anymore. I was walking, I was walking like a scarecrow. <laughs> I'm so glad you're not dead. I just want to say that. You've had a lot of near death things and I'm just yeah. glad I'm glad that you made it cuz this is an absolutely Well, let's, let's not spoil thing. it. Well, I think we all know you made it cuz you're telling the story. So, I'm I I keep going and I I feel the strong strong urge to like just lay down. Oh no. Like I'm I'm entering stage 3 hypothermia because I stop shivering. Mm. I stop shivering and I start feeling really warm and I like I I kind of have a lot of like I'd say confusion. It's like I I couldn't really grasp that like like what I was doing. I just knew keep walking, mm. and I keep walking and I keep walking, and I'm just like I I don't even know how to describe. It. It's almost like a a drunken haze where like you don't know why you're doing a thing. You just, you just know, know you that you're to. doing it, and then I uh I just happen to look to my left and I see two trees that look really familiar and i'm like those are the trees in front of my mom's house oh thank god i would have walked right past it were no there were no lights on at your mom's house no wow. there, there were no lights on anywhere mm. the power was out oh shit that's right um so i uh i i i walk up and i go in through the front door and those <laughs> and i walk in through the front door and the dogs are just yapping their heads off because at, at this me. point how long has it been since they saw you oh, like 12 hours wow well, maybe not that much, maybe more like 10 hours, but it's like, a it's like, time. it's like five o'clock in the afternoon and, uh, and they haven't been out all day and I didn't plan on being gone that long. And, uh, I'm just, I'm just pleading with them. I'm like, please, please stop. I need to take off my clothes. Then I'll let you out guys. I, I just need to take off my clothes. <laughs> and, uh, and my pants were so frozen. Like they literally stood up on their own. Like That's I pulled amazing. them off and set them up. I put, I put them on the ground. And they were just like clunk. <laughs> this would have made great social media content. Yeah. Um, sheets of ice came off when I took off my coat. Like I, I opened it up and it's just like crunch. Mm. And like, sh like just sheets of sheer ice came off my back. Uh, I let them out. They went outside. They did not spend much time outside. I feel like you're glossing over something very important. Dan is naked. Dan is naked yes. in a cold, dark house. I got naked. And he has to, because I remember you told this with uh, Molly. I really enjoyed the detail about you having to go let the dogs out and like open a door butt ass naked after you were already frozen. Yeah. So the but, dogs can um, go pee. But it's almost, it's all, it almost feels warmer to have the frozen clothes off of you. Mm. Um, and because of the scenario of like, like because of how my situation was just house sitting, I didn't actually have any like clothes there to change into. I wasn't planning on, I was planning on like being able to go to my apartment before going to work, changing there. Like I, I didn't plan ahead for an emergency. <laughs> so I didn't actually have any warm clothes. So the only option that I have was to take off all my clothes and like my body can barely move at this point. Like I, I have, I was beyond my limit break of exhaustion yeah two hours before <laughs> so they come back in and i'm so happy to see them but also inside the house i don't even know how cold it was it was i think it was like between 30 and 40 degrees inside the house because the stove has been off all day mm. so i needed to feed the stove immediately immediately or else we were all going to freeze inside the house and the pipes were going to burst um, like I, like if I fell asleep on the couch, I would have woken up to a flood inside the house as the pipes burst. Oh my God. And we were in like negative degrees inside the house. So I, uh, I, I went downstairs completely naked because again, my clothes are frozen <laughs> <sighs> and, 
And I'm just like, I can't even think at this point, but I know that I need to feed the stove. And I look over at all at the wood pile and all the wood needs to be split. Oh my God. <laughs> so I grab the axe and I'm just stage three hypothermia naked splitting wood. You're and lucky you didn't chop any body parts off. I am lucky. Yeah. Um, another thing to think about, and this is such a weird detail. <laughs> my mom's storm door was so old and decrepit that it didn't work anymore. It was just smashed to pieces. Mm -hmm. And my mom just left the doors open. The storm doors to the basement were just left open. Just shaking my head right now. <laughs> which is also why it was so cold in the house. <sighs> is because they just let all the heat go out through the basement. Mm. <laughs> but I will reserve my judgment because <laughs> it was a long time ago. Um, so the basement, while it wasn't negative 60, it might have been like negative 10 or negative 20 down there. And I'm fucking naked splitting wood. And the fire went out, so that meant that I also had to start a fire. This is the naked and afraid portion <laughs> of the show. And uh, and I managed to do that. I did it all. I don't. I barely remember it because I was just I was just so out of it at that point. Yeah, you were just in survival mode. Like and, your body was just doing yeah. the things. And I loaded up the stove as much as I could once I got a fire going, which takes like twenty or thirty minutes. <laughs> then then I went upstairs and I wrapped myself in blankets. And I passed out on the couch naked. And I I've just never, love the detail. Yeah. <laughs> and I've and the dogs, the dogs all piled on top of me because they were freezing, too. Oh, where are the cats? <laughs> oh, who knows? Yeah. They go off and do their own things. Yeah, <laughs> they were fine. They would have been fine. <laughs> and yeah, I just uh, I, I've never been more tired in my entire life than when I had hypothermia. <laughs> and this is the point where we say, I'm really glad you survived. And you should read the comments on your initial post. Oh, I didn't save those. Oh, you didn't? There no. were some good ones. So um, I, I was running a YouTube channel with a guy named Russ. And Russ was uh, the person. Russ texted me because like I didn't have internet there. So I couldn't tell people that I wasn't dead. Mm -hmm. um, and once I got to the house, I finally got enough signal to receive a text. So I saw... That he was like, hey, uh, I saw your post. Are you OK? <laughs> Are you dead? Do we need to send a search party? And I just text him with my frozen fingers and I'm just like, I'm OK. I made it. <laughs> and so on behalf of me, he posted a comment on my Facebook post telling everybody that I was indeed alive. And I made it. And uh, the, the comments ranged from like at first everybody joking yeah. To being like, I'm Are genuinely you? concerned now. I haven't heard from you in a few hours. It's been a long time. Like yeah. somebody even commented, like, I hope you can make it in two and a half hours. And then like three hours later, they're like, um, are you there? <laughs> <laughs> and um, and yeah, uh, one of the comments was Russ. And he's like, before you go, bring a camera. Yeah, he wanted the content. <laughs> he wanted me to vlog it. Yeah. I mean, it would have been a great vlog. I would, but I wouldn't have been able to operate the camera no. at all. That no, would've... you would have needed like a headset, but I yeah. bet you the headset would have frozen. Like, I don't think it would yeah. even have survived because and they I didn't remember... even have that technology back then. They had GoPros, but they were not very good. Yeah, like if you try and use your phone outside and weather like that, it just dies. Yeah, it's just. I mean, I don't know about modern phones, but definitely like a 2014 phone would just fucking die. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> And then uh, then after after uh, it was confirmed that I was alive, somebody was like, oh, right, I'm, I'm really glad that you made it and you're still alive. Now go back and grab a camera and do it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, how much food was in the house to last you till like, oh, things got? Plowed? I mean, there was probably enough. I mean, my mom's a bit of a hoarder. So like, well, she's a prepper prepper. Yeah. yeah. That'd be a, well, she's also a hoarder. <laughs> she's trying to re rehab her hoarder ways, which is why we have a. Uh, uh, a bread maker a bread maker we we have a um uh what do you call it? one of those exercise ease oh an elliptical elliptical yeah she's trying to give us even more stuff she's like anybody want these dishes no <laughs> she's giving away so much stuff that sometimes i'm 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 worried i'm like do you need to tell us anything that you're giving away all your you know your val valuables mm. <laughs> no i get it yeah but i think um i'm curious dan i have a couple a couple questions for you now that you are here to tell the tale, one, what's worse, a uh, once in a lifetime winter snowstorm that you have to trek through or a zombie apocalypse? Oh, 
I don't know. I feel like they're on they're on par. They're on par. Okay. The uh, the difficulties that I had to navigate and the dangers that I faced would have been very similar to a Romero style um, zombie outbreak. Situation. This would actually also be a great story if you added zombies in it too. Like I would watch this movie. Frozen zombies. Yeah. I mean, it know, could be called Frozen. Give, yeah. But I don't want to give like away a Disney movie. I don't want to give away too much, but like I'm thinking this sort of story for book two. Ooh, yeah. Of, uh, of my book series. I feel like it would be epic because there's just zombies and there could be like frozen solid zombies. So much goodness could be yeah. in this. Um, my other question for you is what zombie survival tips do you have based on your, your lived experience of surviving this? Plan ahead. Plan ahead. Um, if you can shelter in place, that's the best option. I was going to say, I think the biggest advice that I gleaned from this story is just if it's a storm like that, just don't leave. Yeah. I mean, I shouldn't have left my mother's house in the first place, Yeah, but I did. Yeah. Um, and as a result, I got punished for it. I, I got punished in a way that it almost took my life. Yeah. Um, and uh, but the but the second time around, I don't believe that it was an option. I don't think. I don't think I, I could have lived knowing that my the, the animals that I was in charge of taking care of um, were going to be in trouble and I wouldn't be able to help them. Well, I'm glad you're able to help the animals, but I would also just like to say for the record, I'm really glad you stayed alive because um, we were not talking in 2014. Yeah. And none of this life that we have right now would exist if yeah. you had died. So it's true. There'd be no podcast. No, there'd be. Yeah. What a, that's, that's the worst part. The no biggest podcast. shame of all. <laughs> uh, that's insane. Should we, um, should we, I feel like we should listen to a couple of zombie clucks and <laughs> yeah. then Chris's story and wrap it up for the day. Chris's survival story. See what we can, oh, what yeah. survival tips we can learn. I want to hear him. that. Yeah. Okay. But I, I need a cluck in between because that was intense. <laughs> yeah. We need a palate cleanser cluck. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are you ready? I haven't I'm listened ready. to this one yet. Mm, yes <laughs> it was kind of soothing until this wow wow yeah this is a mid transformation zo zombie chicken i can tell wait 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 This, this chicken goes for it. I think this person is a singer. Yeah. Because that's some breath control. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let us know if, you, if you've if you ever been a professional singer. Yeah. Or at or least just a good singer. Or even an 80s hair metal band. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody should sample these and make songs. Oh I would God, fucking yes. love that so much. Yeah. Any DJs in the house? DJ in the house. Okay. Uh. Thank you for that palate cleanser, listener. We appreciate your evil munch chicken zombie clucks. Um, we need some more, so please send them along. Got a couple yeah. more for for next evil or not evil magic chicken zombie episode. Next casual dead episode. Are yeah. you ready? I am ready for Chris's story. Yeah. All right, Chris. I thank know you Chris from way back. He was a he was a, a fan of our work with the Snake Fist Explosion. That's fun. Yeah. Um, and when we're listening to this, because we have neither of us have listened to it before. How about if you want to comment on it, you just tell me to pause and we can live react. OK. OK. And we're going to we're going to live react, glean some uh, survival tips for this. So here we go. Let's listen to Chris. Hello, this is Chris here. And Hi, I want to leave you guys a little voicemail. I'm going to be a 28 days later uh, podcast about a survival story. Um, it's about 2011 in this story. And I decide I'm going to go from my hometown out to Portland. Come hell or high water, I'm going. So I go, I got nowhere to go. I got nowhere to go. But thankfully at the time, I have... Why did you go, Chris? <laughs> yeah, didn't you learn anything from our story? <laughs> yeah, were you listening to this back in 2011, three years before it <laughs> happened, to know not to do that? I don't know where this is going, but I already can tell it's a bad idea. Yeah, bad idea, Chris. Don't go. Okay. This is like a movie where I'm like, no, what the <laughs> fuck are you doing, Chris? Don't leave the house! <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll keep going. A partner, and their partner's family member lets me camp out in their backyard. Thank God they let that happen, because otherwise I would have just been homeless in the street. Oh. But it's cold back there. It's cold. Oh, it's freezing. I just realized he had nowhere to go, as in, like, wait. Like, he, he literally had nowhere to go. Um, he left his house because he had to leave his house, because he was houseless. I mean, because I was thinking, I'm so sorry, Chris. Can we start Chris. over? Yes. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Chris. I thought you just, like, chose to leave your house for a good time. 
not because you did not have a house to live in. And I'm very sorry for that. Okay, let's start from the beginning yeah. uh, with context. Yeah. Hello, this is Chris here. Hi, Chris. And I want to leave you guys a little voicemail. I'm going to be a 28 Days Later uh, podcast about a survival story. Um, it's about 2011 in this story. And I decide I'm going to go from my hometown out to Portland. Come hell or high water, I'm going. So I go, I got nowhere to go. I got nowhere to go. But thankfully at the time, I have a partner. And their partner's family member lets me camp out in their backyard. Thank God they let that happen, because otherwise I would have just been homeless in the street. But it's cold back there. It's fall. It's freezing every night. That it's fall. It's freezing every night. Yeah. First of all, I want to give a shout out to the partner's family and community. Yeah. Community care is how That's, we all survive. Nice yeah. yeah. Um, I know not everybody like is cool about the whole idea of like being unhoused. You know, some people like they look at it like a disease, like. Like, ah, gross. I wouldn't let you live in my backyard, even though I have five acres of land. <laughs> the reality is that any of us are really close to this moment. Yeah. Um, I also want to give some context because I know something about Chris and that when he says he left his hometown, he means Wisconsin. Oh, damn. That's far away. Or Michigan. One of the two. Chris, let us know. Yeah. Let us know. But yeah, I think this is um, the reality is I think you and I probably are like two months if 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 jobs were fucked up, like we might have two months before we're in real trouble. Yeah. And that's actually pretty good. <laughs> the average American is like two weeks, basically paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. All I right. feel like it'd probably be like three months before the bank kicked us out. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. The, the foreclosure process might take a little while. Yeah. They'd probably take the <laughs> solar panels back before we lost <laughs> our house. Uh, okay. Let's keep listening. Clear. I dreaded that full moon because my God, it was freezing when you could see the moon. Mm, but thankfully, point. I got a job. Uh, doing bell ringing for the Salvation Army, those bastards. <laughs> bell um, ringer. But it was enough. Pause. <laughs> I did not know this about you, Chris. I you didn't were know a, you were bell a bell ringer? ringer. I didn't know that that was a paid job. I thought it was a volunteer job. And now I feel really bad for all the times I've given those people dirty looks. Uh, you know, this this winter, I tried my hardest to avoid going into a grocery store that had uh, bell ringers on both exits of of the grocery store and i i had to go in so i just walked past them as fast as i could um luckily they didn't even say anything to me they were really they, they didn't even they weren't even paying attention you know it's really i did not realize that was a paid gig wow okay let's keep going i'm gonna put it back just a little bit that's weird. um but it was enough money after about two or three weeks of eight hour days of riding six buses to and from the outskirts of Portland and in downtown to do the for these people uh, where I finally had enough money to rent a really shitty cockroach infested apartment that they now charge a thousand dollars, no, twelve hundred dollars a month for. Back then it was only five hundred. Life is a survival story under capitalism. That is wild. And also your landlord was making money off of you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I saw a really interesting quote somewhere, which is basically like, in order to thrive in capitalism, you have to exploit someone else. That's yeah. the only way. Yeah, it's the American way. Like most people I know who are homeowners in Toronto have renters because they can't afford a home otherwise. But ultimately, that means that they're exploiting somebody. Yeah, that's fucked up. I'm so sorry. OK, a thousand dollars a month for a shitty cockroach infested apartment. Are the cockroaches really big there, Chris? I want to know what a Portland cockroach is like. Yeah, we'll wait. <laughs> yeah, we're just going to pause now. OK, keep it going. And uh, sure enough, I was able to move into that apartment. And uh, thank God, because, oh, my God, I was starting to get sick from sleeping in the tent. Yeah. And it all worked out, though, because three or four months later, I was able to get FAFSA money granted to me and I was able to go to film school to continue awesome. doing video production because it was the only discernible skill I have to this day is using a camera. So there's a story of survival for you. And cluck, cluck. <laughs> That's for you. Okay. I wasn't bye expecting bye. a cluck. <laughs> the cluck, I, that might be the best one. Yeah, I, I think it's the best because I wasn't expecting it. Yeah. <laughs> That was a great end. Wow. Thanks, Chris. That was that was that's a real life survival story. You know, like like, you know, the thing is, like I told a story about like almost dying from hypothermia, but like a lot of survival stories, you might not even realize it was a survival story because sometimes it's just life, you know, um, around 2010, 2011, kind of a similar situation to Chris, except I never had to sleep in a tent. Uh, like I, I had to uproot my whole life and go and live in a cockroach infested apartment as well yeah um, luckily it was 425 dollars a month which even for then was really 
cheap, but it was like, even that I couldn't afford. Um, and, uh, that, that the whole time that I lived there, the, the one from my story, that's the one, yeah. uh, the whole time I lived there was like a survival story because it like, that was, that was a very low income eight years of my life. <laughs> and, uh, and getting through that was, was, uh, was a survival story in itself. So like, if you're, if you're thinking that you don't have a survival story, like survival stories come in all shapes and sizes. Unless you're a billionaire. You probably have one. Yeah. And the middle class is like basically non-existent now. So I don't yeah. know. And like, Leah, you have a lot of survival stories and they're not necessarily freezing to death. They're the, they're a different type. Mostly surviving men. Yeah. I'm not so kidding. Like, you know, you can you can have a survival story just from being around creepy dudes. Yeah, I'll tell those another time. I think we've had enough, <laughs> <laughs> enough survival <laughs> stories for today. Um, but I mean, we do live in a world where being unhoused is like illegal, like it's criminalized. You, yeah. It's it's fucked up. And I'm really glad that um, your partner's parents did that. I hope that they let you use the bathroom and stuff. I, I wish they'd let you live inside. I don't know. Uh, it's a start, but I think... Um, individualism is a disease yeah and you know i think that people that have these types of survival stories where they've they've had to deal with these sorts of like really hard life times where like you can't you, you can't just like get an apartment you can't just not live on the street you can't just buy food to eat those are the people that are going to be the best survivors in the zombie apocalypse because yeah. they've 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 been living the zombie apocalypse before it ever started well, that's the thing about the zombie apocalypse genre is like if you have uh, lived on this planet, odds are some level of your experience is already pretty apocalyptic. If you're any group that has been systematically oppressed, it's already been apocalyptic. Yeah, it's old hat. Yeah, it's like, yeah, <laughs> fucking my, my ancestors and me have been surviving some shit for hundreds of years now, four yeah. or five hundred at this point. So um, but I'm really glad, Chris, that you got to go to film school um, and make a life out of that. And hey, way to go. Like student loans actually doing something good for somebody. Yeah. To get you on your feet again. Um, still think we should forgive student loans, but at least it was a start for you. And I'm glad you're doing OK. At least I hope you're doing OK now. Yeah. And, you know, I feel that about like feeling like you only have one discernible job skill. Yeah. Like even even though I'm I'm a talented person and I'm a capable person. I don't feel like there's anything that I could do to make a reasonable amount of money other than what I'm doing right now. Which physically harms you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which brings us back to the beginning. It does. It all full circles here. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess this episode proves this, the true story that you don't need zombies to have a good story. But if you add zombies, it would be more fun. Like, are there yeah. zombies attacking you or a tent, Chris? Yeah. Are Where there, did the zombies show up in your the zombie, story? Were there zombies inside the house, so you had to live outside? Were there zombie... Co are there cockroaches also zombies? Zombie cockroaches. Oh my god, no. Absolutely <laughs> not. I don't want I don't want to watch that movie. Um, so yeah, we'll do more episodes of Survival. I've got a few that I'd like to share eventually, um, but really appreciate you sharing the realness of that one, Chris and Dan, for you talking about yours too. Uh, we'll listen to more Clucks next time didn't yeah. realize we we're gonna get two entries today i didn't either <laughs> and you know uh i i'd like to encourage everybody to send us a uh, a survival story because like yeah i think this is something that we could talk about because like you know we, we talk about a lot of societal issues under the, the the view of the zombie apocalypse and like i i think that there's a lot of wisdom to gain from people's survival stories I think that um, I would like to hear how community has made a difference because I think that like, um, well, no, your case doesn't involve any. Actually, you know what? You were good. You were a good community member to those dogs. Yeah, I was I was performing my community duty. Yeah. To make sure that those animal friends weren't going to starve to death or yeah. freeze to death. And sometimes that's what community is like. You, a lot of times you think about community in terms of what other people can bring to you. But sometimes you're the person who has to has to put yourself at risk to help your community yeah well my friends it's been a good one yeah what a wild ride by the time you hear this dan will be back at work yeah i'll be Another surviving form of survival. a different apocalypse yeah the, the apocalypse where you get diesel all over your yeah. body all the time the pavement apocalypse <laughs> <laughs> also a great name for a book in the meantime um first of all we've hit 40 this is our 40th episode woo yeah. And in five more episodes, we will be talking to Lori Calcaterra about Path of the Pale Rider, her amazing comic series. 
um, that we are super stoked to be talking with her about. There's also a choose your own path adventure book that is super cool. Highly yeah. recommend. If you like those books when you were a kid, you're going to love this. Yeah, I can't wait. I love those things. Um, yeah, if you if you want to know a little bit more, well, first of all, just check it out on uh, Lori's uh, website, pathofpillrider.com. But also, uh, if you can't be bothered to do that, I'll just tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a Wild West apocalypse. It pays homage to spaghetti westerns and sci-fi and things like Mad Max and The Book of Eli, I Am Legend. You know the ones. Yep. Imagine if Clint Eastwood had to had to go into the and to the town of the Pale Rider. Oh, my God. The Pale Rider. Yeah. Oh, shit. Uh, what, are, what are the other ones that were very similar that he was in? Like Highland Highland Drifter and uh, The Good, the Bad and the Ugly. Imagine there are zombies in those movies. And zombie bears. Zombie bears. And people advocating for the human rights of zombies. Zombie chickens. <laughs> I would love an evil magic chicken zombie <laughs> to appear. Uh, so far, Sylvester's disappointed us. Maybe Lori will surprise <laughs> us. We haven't read the last one yet, so you know, either there better be an evil magic Sylvester chicken zombie. Sylvester said anything's possible. That's true. <laughs> if we get an evil magic chicken zombie in any of Sylvester's books, I will. That will be our true legacy. Yeah, that's that's the Easter egg that we leave in people's books. Yeah, but in the meantime, magic chicken zombie. <laughs> in the meantime, send us your survival story. Now you've heard a couple. They can really be anything. Um, let's talk about how to get all at all of this uh, alive, at least for a while, till we die. Yeah. Also, uh, you can call us with your burning questions. Yeah. You know, we've got a we've got a phone number, like a burner phone, you know, like it's like we're a drug Google dealers phone number. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we won't answer, but you can leave a message and then we, I don't know, drop off your drugs in the in the park. Um, don't ask for drugs. We don't do that. No. Who said we did? I'm not a citizen yet, Dan. Don't at me, government. <laughs> uh, you can call us at 614-699-0006. Uh, you got up to three minutes to send us a message. You can cluck like a chicken because we need more of those clucks. Give us our clucks. Yeah. We want them. They're delicious. Somebody's going to get a t-shirt. Maybe a couple of somebody's. Yeah, we're giving away a, 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 the Evil Magic Chicken Zombie t-shirt, which yes. hopefully is out. If it is out right now and you want one, there's probably a link. <laughs> probably. I don't know. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> and uh, Or you can email us at zombiebookclubpodcast at gmail.com i think you should be a voiceover artist i am yeah technically because <laughs> no, we I do this podcast that's how you should get paid be a voiceover artist in the meantime don't forget to subscribe rate and review come hang out with us on instagram and threads we're there we're just really inconsistent but if you message us we'll eventually get back to you we will one day get back to you yes <laughs> yeah but uh thanks for listening everybody and uh just remember that the end is nigh stay safe out there as long as you can yeah don't, don't leave your house. Don't get bit. Okay. Don't freeze to death. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and if you have to leave your house, remember that it's important to have good relationships with your friends and family. Otherwise, you're fucked. Yeah, it's yeah. true. And if you don't have good relationships with your friends and family, make new ones. Find somebody else's friends and family. Yeah, and make new ones. Because if your original fam friends and family suck, uh, fuck them. You can always make your own. Yeah. The best survival tool is somebody else. It's true, kind of. <laughs> it is. All right. Bye. <laughs> bye bye.